Good evening and welcome to Current Issues. I'm your host, Hisham Tilawi. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, in this uh, second hour, we will be uh, talking with uh, Maysoon Zaid. Maysoon Zaid is a Palestinian American. She has uh, cerebral palsy and uh, she traveled to Palestine recently. And on the way back, something happened with her at the airport. And uh, we're going to uh, uh, let her, once we have her on the phone, we're going to let her tell us exactly what happened. And uh, hopefully we can get her to uh, even after the ordeal that happened with her. And I know she's not laughing about it. Uh, maybe we can have her uh, laugh with us uh, a little bit because, uh, you know, you have to laugh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Even, even at times when you are down, uh, you, you have to laugh. I think laughing will help people at time of uh, distress. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we uh, go to Maysoon, uh, just think about the world around you and what you are seeing on TV. Uh, did, they're, they're talking about, uh, as the caller in the first hour when he said, we, you know, it's the Israelis that are destroying Lebanon. Uh, supposedly, we should have nothing to do with that. Uh, our government definitely is not wanting for this war to stop because they could have stopped it the first day. But instead, they sent a hundred missile shipment to uh, Israel to bomb more targets and more civilians died. As uh, the news uh, uh, that you listen to, uh, they tell you that the Israelis are targeting uh, the bombing targets of Hezbollah, but you are not seeing Hezbollah being killed on the uh, uh, on the ground. It is mainly people. Now Hezbollah killed about a uh, hundred and twenty Israelis. Eighty nine uh, of them are soldiers on the battlefield, but twelve hundred Lebanese have died so far. That's the people that we can count, actually put your hand on them and bury them. As you do know, the problem is not just Israel bombing and Lebanese dying. There's a problem that a lot of people are still under uh, a rebel. There are people are still under rebel alive. There are still, there are people who are wounded and bleeding and no one can get to them. You don't see any of this on the news on the me and the news media that you are watching uh, uh, on uh, other networks. Uh, why? Why? You get to ask yourself why. Is it because really because of two soldiers that are still alive? By the way, we do all this and we are sending Israel still 500 pound bombs. To uh, look, I want you to keep this. Go, go back. Go back to this uh, um, picture. This is a woman, what you are seeing is a woman holding this little, uh, 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 actually it, it, she's a girl. She's about four months old. That's the hand you see in around her, that's her mom's. They are buried, her mom is buried, she is dead, the baby is dead, and she is holding her baby. Now, when you see pictures like this, ladies and gentlemen, I know for a fact, I don't care what church you prescribe to, no one, no one should accept things like this happening in the 21st century. No one. We should be able to have a ceasefire so we will not be looking at pictures like that. It is up to our government to have a ceasefire. If they can, all they have to do is, uh, is say to Israel, stop. But instead, instead, a couple of days ago, one of George Bush's closest friends, Zionist friends, called the Israelis and said, what the hell is going on? Screaming at them, why aren't you fighting? When in the hell are you going to fight? And now you're seeing the major invasion that is happening and taking uh, place right now in front of you. Ladies and gentlemen, 
You will be asked about this. If you believe in God, you will be asked about this. What did you do to stop the killing? And as the first caller who said, we push him back. Shame on you. You are an American. We got nothing to do with this war. This war is for Israel and Israel needs to be stopped. Shame on you watching pictures like this and not doing anything about it. What would Jesus have done, ladies and gentlemen? If you believe in Jesus, all you have to ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And do what Jesus would do. Let's go to Betty on one. Go ahead, Betty. Uh, Dr. Tawali. Yes. Hi. I have really good friends in Lebanon, mm -hmm. and I'm very upset about what is going on. I just tried to call a friend of mine who is in Lebanon. I don't know if he will call me back or what, but I have a feeling that there are a lot of people in Lafayette who have friends in Lebanon. Um, I also have a doctor friend uh, who uh, their uh, granddaughter went over there to visit the, grand, the grandparents and was not able to get out of Lebanon because the airport was bombed. Yes. So I don't know why these people, why people are so uh, impressed with the Jews. Uh, I was just speaking to a couple of my friends today, and they were so pro-Jewish. And I asked them if they had ever heard of the Liberty being bombed, and they had never heard of the USS Liberty being bombed. Can you imagine? Uh, of course. I mean, yeah, of course I can imagine. They, there's probably 1% of Americans know anything about the USS Liberty. There, you know, last week, last week, there was, about a month ago, they arrested uh, one of, uh, an American. He was spying for, uh, for Israel. He was in the United States Navy. Right. Did you hear about him? No. No. And let me tell you, I told them, they said, oh, we'll go to the um, Internet. And I said, please do. Look it up. Because I said, every time that the Liberty, uh, the, um, the um, anniversary of the bombing of the Liberty comes around, the um, spotlight, which it used to be the spotlight, is called right. the American Free Press. And I'm, right. by the way, I've been taking that newspaper for about 30 years. And I said, they honor the men who were killed on the Liberty. Yes. Well, they had never even heard of this. It just amazes me yes. that people yes. don't know what is going on. But what I wanted to ask... By the, way, by the way, Betty, uh, their annual uh, convention conference is coming up next week, uh, next month. And I will be one of the uh, featured speakers there uh, at their uh, conference. And, and where is that going to be? In Washington. Oh, okay. Now, what I wanted to ask you, um, Dr. Tawali, was uh, we, we, sometimes we say we don't know of any congressman who will speak out against what is going on with Israel. Have you ever spoken to uh, Representative Ron Paul? Ron Paul is probably, there's Ron Paul. There's a couple of them, very few of them. Right. Uh, uh, Nick Rehal is one of them. Uh, Senator Byrd is another one. One that unfortunately lost is Cynthia McKinney. She lost uh, yeah, uh, two days ago in the primary. Uh, this is not the first time she lost. She lost uh, a few years back, then she came back, and then now she lost again because of the, uh, yes, there's very few, but the majority of them, they can't speak against Israel because they will take away their uh, campaign monies. APAC, the uh, American Israel Public Affairs Committee, is basically who is funding uh, uh, the, uh, uh, our Congress. Well, uh, okay, a few years ago, Ron Paul sent us, and I wish I had it, but it is a newspaper that is put out in Washington, D.C., it's, it's something about the Jewish news. Maybe you know what it's called. But he, he said the, the then... The forward. The what? The, it's called the forward. Okay. Uh, I think there's also something about the hill. Uh, I'm not sure. But he said then, and I want everybody to listen to me, that he said, that, and he was quoting the, uh, the Jewish newspaper, we, will, we own the Goyim in the Senate and the House. And we will soon own the presidency. That oh. was what was said. Oh, definitely. And I believe that's what is happening today. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. Okay, let's go to uh, Bonnie on three. Go ahead, Bonnie. 
Yes. Uh, last I spoke and called in, uh, you said, "What do? What are you doing?" Yes. To help with this, and I indicated to you that I I was making attempts, and I wanted to tell you that I also wrote in the paper, uh, newspaper opinion uh, things. I, I guess you read them, but I wrote one about Bush and the Bible and his philosophy, which he does not mm -hmm. follow, mm -hmm. and held. And I felt it was a rebuke, but it, it's part of my Christian background that you should do that because those who are in power uh, to whom much is given much is expected and uh, I, I pointed out how he had not met the Ten Commandments and had abused them terribly and you would not believe the calls I got in agreement so there is a stirring out there and people are I, I, people, I even had a college professor that I had years ago that called and, uh, you know, so lots of people are, are becoming aware. They're waking and up. Another, another thing, uh, this, all this one-sided propaganda with only Jewish people coming on the talk shows. Um, uh, I also contact, uh, got online and, and uh, on accuracy, accuracy something. But anyway, you, you get on a list and you, you, they will put you uh, on the list that says that certain people are not presenting the both sides, and I, I uh, signed on to that. You can do that, too. Um, and I indicate, and they ask you who, you know, and I said, uh, Wolf Blitzer. He used to work for the Jerusalem TV station. And the Jerusalem and Post. all he does is promote a Jewish agenda. And also, uh, although I like the domestic agenda that uh, Lou Dobbs has, he does get on that, but he has only had Jewish people on there. He... And yet, Larry King has had both sides. Well, Larry King is, is Jewish, too, so... Uh, well, no, he's agnostic. Now, uh, well, but, uh, actually, he's Jewish. <laughs> but, he, but you notice he had uh, uh, the, the Queen of Jordan on there. Right. Give, and he was presenting the other side. I thought he did a, a good job on that. And, uh, but, and I wanted to say, too, that the Pope even made a statement against all this stuff going on in Lebanon. Yeah. And uh, this infiltration that you're speaking about... Uh, that she was just Betty was whoever that was Betty speaking right. about that. Right. Uh, if you look at at the administration, it's a who's who of Jewish leadership that they have hired. That comes from the two letters. One was to President Clinton, and if you look at who signed that letter, the Jewish C Pack. I mean, uh, N Pack. What's it? N Pack or A Pack? It's C Pack or A or N Pack or something. A Pack. A Pack. A Pack and uh, that. No, no, not that one. That's the Jewish lobby. There's another one, CPAC. And uh, those two are the names that are on that list that went way back in 96 or 5 or whatever it was, to a letter to President Clinton wanting to do all this stuff. And again, sent to President Bush, the same names, and those people ended up in the Bush administration. Oh, yes, yes. You, you, well, no, that is the, that is the... Uh that is, that's the one I was talking about in the first hour, which is a policy paper that was written by Richard Pearl and Douglas Faith, uh, or Faith, which is the uh, clean break, uh, uh, securing the realm, uh, a strategy for securing the realm. Uh, that's basically what they're doing, and uh, it was a strategy for Israel, and these two, amongst others, they uh, surfaced uh, on high positions in the uh, Bush administration. Bonnie, I'm, I'm going to have to go because we have a lot of people on, uh, okay, on call. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for calling. Okay, the last call, and then we're going to go uh, for the, uh, to, to the guest. Go ahead, Rick. Rick? Rick or Vic? This is uh, Vic. Okay, Vic. Okay, I just want to recommend uh, a book called When the Rivers Run Dry. There are two chapters in there, chapter 18 and chapter 19. They point out that what's going on now in the Gulf there is a, a water war. There's one line in here, chapter 18 says, In 1964, Israel hijacked the waters of the Jordan River. And another chapter is, Palestine poisoning the wells of peace. I just want to recommend this. Uh, has a different uh, angle on what's going on right there right now. It's it's a water war and um well well Vic uh, uh, just to kind of uh, uh, comment on what you're saying, the water is part of the formula. Yes, I have to agree with you. Expansion is when while you expand, you are going to get some as we call that we say down here lanyard. and the water will be uh, uh, an extremely important in this formula. Yes, I agree with you. Thanks, Vic. Appreciate it. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going with Maysoon, who patiently has been waiting here 
Good evening, Maysoon. Maysoon, are you with me? Is she with us? Maysoon? Are you with me? We lost her? Okay, let's go ahead and call her back to where we are. Okay. Um, let's see, while we are trying, you know, she was on and we were, uh, I guess we got um, disconnected. Uh, she probably uh, could not hold on that long. Uh, but as we are uh, trying to get her, um, you know, it's what, what the callers have said, what the callers have said is really important. Uh, you know, you do have, especially like Bonnie, when she said that she wrote uh, uh, an article and published it in the paper, uh, those opinions in the newspaper, in the local newspapers, they are extremely important. Okay, I believe we do have Maysoon with us. Maysoon, are you with me? Maysoon? Yes. Yes, hi, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me on. Um, Maysoon, uh, I told our viewers that you had a problem coming from uh, Palestine. You recently visited Palestine. Now, before we, go into the, before we go into the problem you had, just tell me what's going on in Palestine very briefly right now. Well, what's going on in Palestine right now? Um, I went back to Palestine on the 1st of July, and basically I've been working in Palestine with disabled, orphaned, wounded, refugee children since April of 2001. And what I saw for the first time ever in my life was actual malnourishment in Palestine. I was stunned, absolutely stunned, because having worked and worked and worked, I'd seen a lot of chest injuries, I had seen a lot of torn families, but I had never actually seen malnourishment. And um, the Israeli foreign minister made a comment that I found, as a comedian, deplorable, which was, he said, we're not starving the Palestinians, we're putting them on a diet. And I have to tell you, they're not on a diet, they are starving them. Um, okay. The orphanage hasn't been able to get powdered milk in three months, because powdered milk is not available in the West Bank, but you can easily buy it within the green line. The only thing is that Israeli store owners will not sell more than one uh, tin of powdered milk to an Arab. So I went in and tried to buy it. They told me there was only one. I sent in an amazing Jewish friend of mine who was volunteering with me, and they sold her ten. Wow. That so is that's interesting. The first, that's the first thing that's going on. The second thing is that nobody has money. Um, the Sulta and the people who used to work in the PA and with Fatah have not been paid since February. Hamas has had their accounts completely frozen, and the European NGOs are nowhere to be found. So there's just no money, and with no money, people can't buy goods, and the economy is basically collapsing. Now, what, what areas uh, did you go into uh, while you were there in Palestine? I was in three refugee camps outside of Ramallah, Amari, Kalandia, and Jalazun. I was in uh, Khalil, also known as Hebron, Abu Dis, Bethlehem, Nablus, Silwad, Zedabran, and Lid. I actually did some work in Lid where they bring children from Gaza with terminal cancer to be experimented on, basically, rather than treated. They bring them to hospitals and within Israel and do experimental cancer treatments on them. Um, I hope they're doing it so the kids can get better and not just uh, use them as guinea pigs. Now, you are involved with some uh, children's project uh, in Palestine. It's called Maysoon's Kids. Yes, I, uh, I founded Maysoon's Kids in April 2001 to address the uh, growing issue of disabled children in the Palestinian uh, country because uh, unfortunately, the Arab culture is not very good at dealing with disabilities, so my goal was to go in there and kind of elevate the treatment and the education of disabled children. I've been doing so ever since. <laughs> and uh, we buy all Palestinian-made products. The diapers we use are made in Palestine. The shoes we use are made in Palestine. The toys we give are made in Palestine. Um, medications and physical therapy equipment we have to get abroad because they're simply not made in Palestine, but whatever we can buy made in Palestine, we do to inject some money into the economy. Now, uh, Maysoon, uh, I mean, I know you personally, and I know that you have a physical uh, problem. 
uh, how was it? Uh, uh, how were you able, like, to to to, to travel uh, uh, through uh, Palestine? Was it was it easy? Was it hard? How is it? It's, you know, it's really easy to go to Palestine because Continental flies there, and uh, Continental's great. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm a stand-up comic, so I have a lot of frequent flyer miles, so I get to um, to fly in first class. The problem is when you arrive. And the problem with arriving is that um, the Israelis have been turning away Arab Americans pretty consistently. I was extremely lucky, and I got in. And I think the policy of turning away Arab Americans in the Israeli airport is so grotesquely racist. And I haven't quite figured out why no one found a way to be like, look, if the Israelis were turning away all black Americans, people would see that that was racist. Why is it okay to turn away Arab Americans? I myself was born and raised in New Jersey. I identify as American, and I'm shocked that the American government allows Israel to treat me differently just because of my ethnicity. Does that mean I'm not an equal citizen? And so when I get in, there's usually a really, really long period of interrogation. They go through my bag. Um, take everything out, put everything back in, and then they sit and decide whether you can get in or not. I thank God, mashallah, 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 got in and um, went on my way to Palestine and did my work. And then when I was exiting, um, they really took to me. Okay, and tell me, tell me sure about that. What I never. They tried to make sure I never came back to Tel Aviv. In fact, at some point, the security woman said to me, maybe next time you should go through Jordan. Basically, what happened was I arrived at the airport to fly out to Newark, New Jersey, on Continental. And um, I got there, and as soon as the Israeli security saw me, they just, they just went for me. And I was in my wheelchair, and the woman asked me how I'd gone to the airport. And, I mean, as you know, I'm a stand-up comic. I travel all over the world. I'm really independent. I said to her, you know, I drove my, my Avis rental car to the airport. And she said, you're a cripple. You can't drive. So I showed her my disabled license and said a lot of disabled people drive and thought, wow, she's just really, you know, naive and doesn't, and stupid, basically. Then they took me and they opened my bags and they searched everything and then they took me and strip searched me. They strip searched me down to absolutely naked and took my clothes to scan them. When they brought back my clothes, something was missing. And, uh, you know, it's uncomfortable to say this to a man, but, um, and they had taken my maxi pad, and I had my period, and they had confiscated my maxi pad. So I asked them to give me another one. They said they didn't have any. I said, that's okay, I have some in my hand luggage. Staying calm. I mean, I was disgusted by the calm. And at that point, they informed me that I wasn't allowed to touch my hand luggage, and I would be allowed to board the plane only carrying my passport. Um, they wouldn't let me take my Quran. They wouldn't let me take my stuff that's in our man, who I always have with me. And they wouldn't let me take my maxi pads or my medication. Um, I take special medication because of my cerebral palsy that helps me with balance so that I don't throw up. And they would not let me have my meds for a 12-hour flight. So I boarded the flight covered in blood. I mean, covered in blood. The stewardess wrapped me in a blanket, rifled through all their luggage, got me a pair of their shorts, Chris, the male flight attendant shorts, and I changed into those. And then proceeded to throw up six times over the course of the flight because I wasn't allowed to have my medication. Now, to, to tell me, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to imagine how, if any one of our viewers can, would go through this, how would they feel? Tell me, tell me, how, were, how did you feel walking into that airplane in, in the shape that you were in? Well, I mean, it was worse for me, I think, because as I was boarding the airplane, a woman tapped me on the shoulder, and she said to me, are you the comedian? And in that moment, I knew that they had dehumanized me to the point where I was irrecognizable, both to myself and those that were around me. I felt really dirty. I felt low class. I felt like someone who, I felt because I was in the wheelchair, that people might think I was retarded and I didn't know any better, and that's why I was covered in my own blood. 
And I just wanted to scream, like, this is not me. This is not who I am. I'm not dirty. I know how to take care of myself. They're doing this to me. They want to shame me. They want to embarrass me. They want to humiliate me. And when I got home, I was just, and I asked her, as I said to you, I asked her, are you doing this to me because I'm Arab? And she said, yes, and maybe next time you should go to Jordan. Well, um, also, I mean, the, the, do you think they also did it because of what you do? I mean, after all, you are a comedian, and most of your no. com most of I your comedy is you, you're trying you're trying to show what's going on in the Middle East through comedy. See, I would have thought that when I came in, because when I came in, they scanned my name and they said to me, "We've seen your website." They said they've seen my website. I don't think that was the case going out because she never scanned my passport. As soon as she opened my passport and saw an Arab name. She went for me. She took it to another room to find out who I was. I don't think I'm on some most wanted list. I think the simple fact that there was an Arab in her airport was enough to make her behave inhumane. Okay. Please. Mason, stay with me. Uh, we're going to take a break, and then also we will... Uh uh, we welcome all your, uh, uh, your phone calls, our viewers' phone calls. Uh, just phone stay calls. with Yay. Stay with me. Uh, Palestinian American comedian Maysoon Zayed. Uh, Maysoon, um, so, I mean, how long is the flight? About 18 hours? The flight is 12 hours. 12 hours. Yeah, uh, 12 hours straight from Tel Aviv to Newark. Okay, and uh, now by the time you got here to the States, I'm sure you had calmed down a little bit. Um, no. I was even more furious when I got to the United States, and a continental representative met the flight because, you know, because of my comedy, um, they know who I was, and they felt really bad about what happened, and they met the flight, and I was more furious and more indignant landing because I knew that, I, you know, I got back to the USA and was like, I'm here, I'm home, I'm supposedly a citizen here, and I know for a fact that the, the government of this country is going to do nothing to defend me. So I felt like I was flying from one place that didn't want me to another place that didn't want me, and it was really upsetting, honestly. So did you did you contact the State Department and explain to them what happened? I contacted the State Department. I've contacted a bunch of uh, my congressmen. Um, I've contacted Daryl Issa and Nick Ray Hall. I've contacted Jim McDermott um, to just let them kind of know what happened. Um, with me, and I am in the process of talking to a series of lawyers to see if I can possibly do, because maybe that's the only thing to do. I, it, it was just, I mean, it was torture. It was torture, not in the physical sense, but it was the dehumanization and the humiliation that has been really hard for me to cope with, and my career is all about making people laugh, and I arrived at 430 and had a show the next night, um, and Dino Vidala, the other comedian, and I taped a TV show called The Watchwood for Comedy Central. And we, I was so out of it. And everyone was like, this isn't me soon. And I don't know what it is about that event, but it was really dehumanizing. And it's been really hard for me to bounce back. 
Well, I mean, my son, look, look what they are doing in uh, in Gaza and the West and Bank, and also look what they're doing in Lebanon. So, uh, and I mean, I just have to point out, like, what's happening in Lebanon is absolutely an act of terror, without a doubt. It's an attack on the civilian population. But as people watch Lebanon, they need to make sure that they don't forget that these smoke and mirrors are something Israel loves. Because they know that attention is distracted from Gaza. And when I was in Palestine, I would hear the daily numbers of who was being killed in Gaza and just think, my God, the rest of the world does not know that children, civilians, adults are being killed because of the attention is so focused on Lebanon. Okay. Um now, uh, I, I want to go back and, and talk uh, about uh, what you saw in Palestine, uh, because it's very important uh, that we get this eyewitness account of, of what's going on. The, the stuff that people don't see on the news, like the day-to-day -day living uh, for a, a Palestinian family who has been under siege for since 2000, uh, as a matter of fact. How are people living there? How can they... Uh, uh, People are not living there. People stopped living there in February. I mean, they're the walking dead. They're sitting in their homes day after day, terrified that their family members in Haifa and Yaffa and Tepshiha are at danger with all the bombing that's going on up there, wondering about their friends and family that are in Beirut. And basically, I'm deceived constantly. When I call my friends in Gaza, there are always bombs going off around them. Always. There's always shooting in the background. I've been shot at in Abu Dhabi. I've been shot at at Kaledia. These people are not living. They are the walking dead. They live in absolute terror and fear. And I don't think it's something that the general public is aware of, of, especially, especially, especially for the disabled population. One of the most common things my students say to me is, I'm always afraid I won't be able to escape because when you're wheelchair bound or you're blind, it's hard to navigate quickly. And it's a place that's all about ducking and getting cover and getting out of the rubble and racing out of the building before they both go there. Okay. So, um... I guess you did not try to kill them uh, with laughing, huh? I always do. I did a comedy show on my last trip. Um, I've done comedy shows in Ramallah, Haifa, Nazareth, Bethlehem, and now I did a show in Jezebel, my hometown on this trip. So, okay. even in the airport, even when they're gunning for me, I'm always still telling jokes. So, like the um, woman who took my maxi pad, I was like, wow. You're more evil than a Palestinian mother-in-law, and that's evil, you know. <laughs> so, um, uh, have you after, I mean, how long has this been? When did you get back? I got back a week ago. A week ago. Have you yeah. thought about the episode and came up with anything uh, funny? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the night I got back from the airport, I, um... I I, uh, I had to do a comedy show, and that night I did a uh, joke about it's the Israeli airport, and I talked about how, as a Palestinian Muslim version with cerebral palsy, my favorite part of going to the Israeli airport is the strip search, because, you know, as a 30-year-old virgin, I don't get to be naked as often as I'd like. So actually, when the Israelis bring out my clothes, I'm like, no, I don't want them. And I grew up in New Jersey, which is an Italian Catholic town, and in New Jersey, there's not any other Muslims. And one of the things that always made me really sad growing up was that I didn't get to celebrate Christmas. And I feel really bad for the Israelis at Ben Gurion Airport because they don't get to celebrate Christmas either. So I like to bring Christmas to the airport. And what I do is I wrap every single article of clothing like a festive Christmas gift. And I wrap in little surprises like a Lebanese sandwich or all women have to use my to beds. I just use mine and then I wrap them up and leave them. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know what I, what I thought, I imagined you when you walked into that airplane, uh, w walked in and said, look, don't piss me off, I already have blood on my hands. No, ah, that's nasty. <laughs> that's nasty. 
Um, actually, I thought about, uh, you know, uh, something else that if they had given you, uh, not the pads, but the other stuff that has that string. Well, I'm not allowed to use that because my but, dad told uh, no. me many But I imagined, ago, I imagined you, horses, you know, no uh, uh, lighting riding. them up <laughs> like sticks of dynamite and throw them all over the plane. <laughs> I don't know how to light a match, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was never allowed to. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I yelled at my father when I got home. I said, this is all your fault, because had he let me use the other thing, they wouldn't have been able to take it, would they? But my father has a deathly fear of that, and, like, you know, we're not allowed to use tampons, ride carousels, or horseback riding or bicycles. And seesaws, my father is actually convinced, were invented by the Zionists. <laughs> Um, so, um, are we going to do a call-in now? I'm sorry? Are we going to do a call-in now? I'll tell you what. Uh, I see uh, we have somebody uh, waiting. Let's go. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Gene. Yeah. Hey, Sean, I'd like to ask Ms. Uh, Mashoum or whatever. Uh, what is it that she don't understand? I mean, jihad is a big been declared on America and it's a holy war and we got to look at Muslims cause that whole base is coming out of there and I don't understand why the good Muslims, the true Muslims aren't speaking out. Now Eugene, let me ask you a question. Uh, now, Miss Miss Maysoon, she's uh, she's a comedian. That's what she does. Now, uh, you have she does not she, she does not know you. I know you. You called this show and you called this show earlier, and uh, you know you you even talked as if you were an Israeli. Um, you know what would have what would have you done if this was your sister going through the airport like this? That's what I thought. He hung up. Okay. Exactly. Because you know. Really, have they taken my carry-on luggage? Fine. But the fact of the matter is, they took my medication. And that can never be justified. That can never be justified. They cannot say, I took her maxi pad for security. I took her medication for security. Because no one will buy it. They can take my laptop. They can take my Walkman. They can take my iPod. They can take everything else. But medication and maxi pad are... Now, you, now you do life. need your medication because actually you, you, you throw up if you don't take your medication. And I threw up six times on a 12-hour flight, risking dehydration, and possibly even worse because of cerebral palsy is a neurological disorder. And putting that kind of pressure on myself is extremely, extremely dangerous. And I have a medical card to prove it, and I tried to show her the medical card, and she wouldn't look at it. Okay. You know, and, and the greatest thing I did was I took the phone numbers of Colette and Chris and the entire crew on Continental because I know that Americans are trained to think that we're lying and that Israel really never, ever, ever, ever does kill civilians purposely. It's always an accident. Well, then they're accidental. I don't think even Geico would cover them. Um, but, like, I took the names and numbers of the flight attendants and the stewards so that I would have people bear witness to what happened to me. Right. Okay, let's go to the phones uh, with uh, Bob. Go ahead, Bob. And, and Hisham, you'll need to repeat the question because I can't hear okay. the phone calls. Uh, this is Bob. I just called back because we got cut off. While what line is Bob on, guys? And like I was saying, you know, this is a jihad that was declared on the rest of the world. And what does jihad mean? Holy war? Uh, let me, uh, l listen, Eugene. Uh, Wait a it's not Eugene, it's Eugene, 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 Eugene. Eugene, listen to me, listen to me. This is not the time, this is not the time to start your garbage, okay? It ain't garbage, it's garbage, it's truth. Why can't you face it? Jihad, okay. All right, let's go to uh, Randall on three. Go ahead, Randall. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Flawley. I do have a question for Ms. Zayed. Sure. Uh, Ms. Zayed, do you think if you were a Christian and supported the Palestinian cause, you would have probably received the same treatment or less or more severe? Because everybody's under the impression that Christians are welcome with open arms in Israel. As long as you agree with Israel, I believe that would be the case. But if you no. against the Israeli position, I don't think you'd receive much different... Um, no, uh, 
treatment. Absolutely not. Okay. You know why you, I say no um, is because Palestinian Christians also have Arab names, and American passports don't say your religion. Mason happens to be a Christian name. Um, I have a Christian name. Um, Zayed, my last name, is a very famous name in a big Christian community in Ramallah. So really they had no way of telling if I was a Muslim or a Christian just based on my name because my passport doesn't state it. That being said, my friend Jackie, who has also gone through the airport as a Palestinian Christian from Bethlehem, um, is treated just as severely as I have. Basically, it's not a religious issue. It's a race issue. And they are only concerned with whether you're Arab or whether you're Jew, Jewish. And if you're an Arab, you're going to be discriminated against, regardless if you're a Buddhist, you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, or a Mormon. So, so being, you know, having an American passport and being an American, that really did not help you much. It really doesn't, and that's what's been so offensive for me. Is I'm born and raised in the U.S. I actually hold no other citizenship, and I think I should be treated the same as any U.S. citizen and not discriminated against based on my ethnicity. Now, we don't turn back Israelis here uh, if, they're, if, they're, uh, if they come into the United States because we do have an agreement with Israel. Basically, we right. will let their citizens come to uh, our country and then they are to allow Americans go on to, uh, to Israel. Absolutely, absolutely. We have that agreement and also, as I said, if you put the race test through, the U.S. State Department's website says Palestinian Americans may have trouble entering the state of Israel. I dare them, I dare them to replace the word Palestinian with the word black. Can you imagine if there was an alert that said black Americans would not be allowed in Israel or Jewish Israelis would not be allowed in America? People would go absolutely insane. And right, I, yeah, and try. Because it's Palestinian, it's okay. Exactly. Imagine, imagine if uh, someone would be returned from New York just because they were Jewish. Exactly. Imagine yeah. that. Imagine if it was because they were Asian or because they were disabled or because they were female. We would be disgusted with that. And another point I need to bring up, because this is the first forum I've had to, to use the comparison, there's been pictures all over the place of Israeli children, female children, little girls, finding rockets sent to bomb Lebanon. Now, if that was an Arab child finding a rocket, they would call us savage. Well, but I mean, when you're uh, Israeli you know, child, it's a human interest story. This is ridiculous. If they truly don't believe in the killing of civilians, why are they bombing the infrastructure? Why would they attack on two soldiers? Soldiers who are valid military targets. Valid military targets responded to with a carpet bombing of Beirut. One of the most beautiful cities I've ever went to has been destroyed because Israel feels like they are above the law. And they need to stop saying that Hezbollah is hiding between civilians. That does not justify killing civilians. That's why, like, when there's a hostage situation, they don't blow up the whole bus unless you're in Russia and you've gassed the theater. They don't do that. They try to get the hostages out safely. So, basically, Israel has no, no respect for civilian life, whether it's children or women or anything else. And all they care about is furthering their agenda. And the U.S. rushing them bombs is disgusting. Well, some of their uh, rabbis, uh, the first week of uh, fighting, they, uh, they, had, they met and they had uh, actually a statement saying that at time of war, uh, it's okay to kill uh, civilians, m uh, women, and children. If this had been a Muslim uh, uh, cleric that had declared uh -huh. that, the whole world would be hearing about it. But uh, we did not hear about it on uh, Western media that rabbis in Israel said it's okay to kill women and children. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, when little children or small children are signing bombs to go kill other children, we need to, as a human race, not Arab, not, not Jewish, not Christian, not Muslim, none of that stuff. As a human race, we need to realize that this is sick and twisted, okay. and that people who raise their children to send bombs to kill other children are twisted. So just because it's an Israeli child, finding a bomb doesn't make it not sick. Tell you what, we have a lot of people waiting to talk to you. Let's go to Ron. Go ahead, Ron. Uh, yeah, no, 
Doc, uh, I saw your uh, video on uh, your trip to Palestine. Yes. And I was very interested in uh, in acquiring a copy, but uh, I'll sure. get with I'll get with you later or. Uh, sure, just send me send me an email uh, with your address. I'll I'll get you a copy of it. Okay, and uh, uh, you know I, I don't think a lot of people are aware of uh, supposedly you know uh, the Hezbollah was the one that penetrated uh, Israel and captured the two soldiers and what have you. Well, the free press uh, said that it was the other way around, that the uh, Israelis went into uh, Lebanon, and I guess they were on some kind of patrol or what have you, and they were captured. So they were the aggressors initially. I think everybody thinks that Hezbollah was the aggressor. So. Well, you know what, Ron? Even if Hezbollah was the aggressor, even if Hezbollah went in there and, and captured two soldiers, by the way, Israel occupies... Uh, 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 Lebanese uh, uh, L Lebanese areas, and they have been. You know, the thing that they're saying they left in 2000, they did not leave. They're still holding what's called the, uh, the Shabah farms. And uh, right. so if they're I'm, occupying hey. your land, you have the right to, uh, uh, you know, to fight for your land. Ron, hold on, hold on a second for me. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, what I'm saying is that this is not a religious uh, discussion. It's a discussion about humanity. I'm on home. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, go ahead, Ryan. Uh, yeah, and I also saw uh, uh, some uh, a, a film on uh, some prominent uh, Americans that went over to Palestine, and uh, they showed uh, the what the wall had done to the Palestinian uh, people, towns, cities, uh, economy. You know what, Ron? Uh, let me ask my son because I know she went and saw the wall. Tell us yeah. about the wall, my son. Hey, uh, I just want to let you guys know, I was actually sitting at a birthday dinner for my friend Corey before you went, and we're sitting here with a group of, of really eight Americans who are listening to basically what I'm saying, Jewish, Italian, Catholic, Christian, who are listening to what I'm saying. And as I say, I'm listening to them talk, I can tell that the U.S. media is not portraying what's happening in the Middle East the way that I have seen it on the ground. Okay. Uh, you, uh, Ron talked about the wall. Uh, did you go see the wall? I saw the wall, and the wall is the one of the greatest atrocities I've ever seen with my own eyes. It is scary. Um, actually, I've been blessed and lucky. I happen to live in an apartment that is cut, intersected by the wall. So I have one, ha one door in the West Bank and one door in Jerusalem. So I saw the wall every single day, and it's stifling. It's stifling, it's stifling. You can't even breathe. And when wow. you go to Bethlehem, the wall actually opens to let you in. It looks like something out of Star Wars. And it's really just, just frightening. It's, it's disgusting. It's a land grab. And the, the thing that drove me the craziest about the wall is that it was separating Arabs from Arabs. But the thing that I found the most beauty in was the amazing, incredible paintings and artwork that have uh, popped up on the surface of this light known as the wall. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's right. ridiculous. Okay. It's Thank sick. you. Thank you, Ron. Okay, let's go to Canada with Ramsey. Go ahead, Ramsey. Hello, sir. How are you? Hi. Sir, um, I just want to uh, comment on what you said um, about, the, uh, about the, the, the Jews. Like, yeah, I have an article here that says that the Yaisha Rabbinical Council announced in response to an IDF attack in Kana that according to Jewish law, during a battle of war, there's no such term as innocence of the enemy. See, that shows you how, how, how supremacist uh, the, the Jewish state is. Israel. And, well, uh, I mean, just imagine, imagine if this was a Muslim cleric who, uh, uh, you know, who would make a statement like this, that it's okay to kill... Uh, civilians and uh, women and children. Imagine if that, you know, how they would carry it. You know, the guy be, uh, uh, who was... Front page news all over the place. 
Right. Now, you know, the guy who was asking about jihad, jihad, you know, the great jihad, you know, they don't understand jihad is a word that means struggle. The biggest jihad, as a matter of fact, in Islam, just, just for those people, the biggest jihad, but, the major but jihad, guys, is I the think jihad we within... need to make a clear distinction between Jewish and Israeli. Because I get very uncomfortable when I hear the word Jewish being bandied around as opposed to Zionist or Israeli. Okay. Because I think that we need to keep that distinction really clear. That this is not about religion. This is Zionism. This is a lack of humanity. And the Jewish Americans I know, and even some Jews living in Palestine that I know, and I do know Jews living in Palestine, do not approve of this inhumane treatment. Right. I, I agree with you. Um, now, the, uh, the question was about the, uh, you know, these rabbis, and rabbis represent a religion. And right. that was, that's the question. But I agree with you, not all Jews are... Uh, with this uh, this war and with these atrocities, right? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are just some like out there. All, but but you know what? Like you know what I found out, Mason? Their their voices are not being heard, though. I mean, I have a lot of right. I have friends who are Jews, and and they do oppose Israel, but their voices are not being heard. Why are their voices not being heard? For for the same reason that my voice and your voice not being heard. Mm -hmm. Ramsey. Yeah, go ahead, Ramsey. I just want to make a comment uh, about your uh, caller, uh, Eugene, who doesn't know anything about history. He has to understand that the United States supported the Muslims who, who declared uh, jihad. They created Osama bin Laden. They created uh, uh, Al Qaeda. Ha ha Israel created uh, Hamas uh, okay. because the United States needed an excuse. It needs an excuse in order to justify. Or, or to make this uh, war on terrorism uh, so, so they can pursue their political uh, okay. interests. Uh, Ramsey, I appreciate the call. We're running out of time. Let me catch another call here with uh, Betty. Go ahead, hey, Betty. You, Sam? Yes. Yes. Before you I take that know. call, oh, can I just that line is shout out? Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, say that again. I said before you take the next call, can I just make sure that everyone has the website? Okay, I think we are having a bad connection with Maysoon. Maysoon, if you can Hello. hear me, thank you for coming on the show. You. Thank you. We are running out of time. www.maysoon.com Thank you very much. Actually, we are going to put that uh, on the screen. Please uh, enter your destination number thank followed you, by Maysoon. the pound key. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, I saw they put Biddy's name, but then there's no one, so... You know, uh, of course, Eugene is trying to play with, uh, with the phone lines and uh, calling on a different line, but that's okay. I mean, that's terrorism, Eugene, if you don't know that, because what you are doing is basically being a little terrorist. So that's okay. We'll put up with you. Uh, but uh, just try to grow up. Now, let me answer, because this is something you hear about jihad, jihad. If you know anything about Islam, ladies and gentlemen, the biggest jihad in Islam is the jihad within yourself is the struggle between good and evil don't tell me you don't have evil on you all of us do because that's how our creator had put in us we have nothing to do with that we have good and bad the biggest struggle is the struggle within yourself to be good not to kill children not to kill women that's the biggest struggle. So if you want to know the jihad, I declare jihad on myself, which is just an Arabic word means, means struggle. So I struggle within myself as you do, everybody does, to do what's right. And that's what we need, is to do what's right. And actually the small jihad, small jihad in Islam is actually when you go to war. You go to war for, to defend yourself, Defend your family, defend your land, defend your religion. That's what you go to war for. You are not to attack. You defend if you are attacked. And if, if, the, if the opponent drop their weapons, you are supposed to stop. How many times you've seen cars bombed when they have white flags on them with families? Ladies and gentlemen, next week, remember, we will be on channel 15 not channel 5, we'll be on channel 15 for next week and also we're going to have Lyndon LaRouche with us for next week don't miss it, it'll be a good show 
We will see you then Thursday. Don't forget, Channel 15. Good night.